Hello and welcome to session three of uh, Blockchain Associations Forum. In this session, we have um, uh, Singapore and Indonesia. And first, I would like to um, go ahead with uh, Singapore. And we have a, a recorded clip from uh, Professor David Lee, who is the um, head of Global FinTech Institute and also a professor of economics at uh, Singapore University of uh, Social Sciences. First of all, I'd like to thank the Journal of the British Blockchain Association for inviting me to share my viewpoints on today's topic. Hello, everyone. My name Hello, is... Um, I'm not sure if uh, you can hear me. We're having some technical difficulties yeah, with uh, Amy at the moment. So, uh, I use on crypto asset policies and the future of global economy. And what have we learned from the past and what can we do better in the future? Financialization in the crypto economy refers to the increase in size and importance of financial activities relative to its overall economy. The consequences of over-financialization include the possibility that one, financial markets have a more significant influence over firms and the real economy. Two, the economy is more dependent on the strength of the financial sector. Three, Widening inequality as a finance sector can often capture rel relatively high salaries and profits. Four, over-speculation of financial assets leads to over-emphasis on regulation for mass adoption. Over-financialization has distracted the crypto community from its most important mission, which is privacy protection in an environment that resembles the wilderness or an open or high sea. Wilderness is when the virtual space may be uncultivated, uninhabited, and inhospitable. In comparison, an open ocean is an area beyond physical reach or a high sea that is not within the control or jurisdiction of any particular state. The malicious elements are active in both the wilderness and the high sea. That must surely be the most critical mission of anyone involved in Web3 to secure privacy protection. That has not been the case in the last few years when DeFi has taken center stage. Ironically, it is the CeFi the regulatory movement towards anti-speculation. For a country that has two casinos, the cry out is more significant and louder than most campaigns that we have seen in Singapore in recent years. Besides guarding against over-financialization, regulators have begun to emphasize the utility value of Web3 projects using the best features of blockchain and cryptography. The complex token economies often high risk. Stakeholders are consistently warned to discipline themselves to promote the healthy development of the industry. In particular, investors should not FOMO innovative projects without understanding the mechanics and promote immature fintech of crypto products to retail investors. That call by regulators will inevitably return to the basic idea that the immense potential value comes from Web3 privacy protection. Licensing alone cannot unlock that vast potential value, nor can zero trust. On the other hand, if the crypto community only focuses on securing privacy protection and not on climate protection with renewable energy and reusing 
heat generated from mining, their relevance will wane over time. It is because by distributed communication, the renewable energy source is key to decentralization. The, or the alternative energy source and innovative use of heat emission are vital for the community to forward its interests without resistance from regulators. Well, what did not go well regarding crypto asset adoption and crypto policy making in Singapore? What went well that we can learn from? The market in Singapore is small due to the size of the population. So it is not easy to develop a robust local community. Yet, Singapore has done so with innovative token regulation, clear guidelines, consistency and transparency. More importantly, the crypto pioneers emphasize doing good with cryptocurrencies and blockchains rather than over-speculation. That spirit has somewhat been overswam by rent-seeking behavior in the past two years, leading to the failures of many good social projects, even projects that have won awards from the Monetary Authority of Singapore have failed to take off with enough funding. The operation cost in Singapore is relatively high. Therefore, financial sustainability is an issue if the treasury of startups is not well endowed or lacks financial management skills. Singapore may continue encouraging shared working space, cloud computing, and AI services to improve efficiency and save costs for Web3 companies. But so far, few indigenous projects have flourished because of the lack of liquidity and low valuation. Of course, a few have done well enough with licenses issued to them to expand beyond Singapore. In addition, there is a shortage of technical talents in Singapore because of the exponential growth of Web3. So Web3 companies have to seek talent overseas or outsource, which may slow down the development process. The Employment Pass scheme is being enhanced for global talents to relocate to Singapore. The main advantage of Singapore is that a group of civil servants deeply understand cryptocurrency. They can make good policies in time to guide the industry in the right direction and maintain a flexible policy environment. As early as 2019, Singapore has determined that cryptocurrencies are intangible assets. Tax guidance has clarified the legitimacy of holding cryptocurrency assets. The government will continue to issue licenses to a small number of qualified companies that anticipated. Even companies that have not obtained licenses for the time being can carry on business under an exemption or conditions and restrictions in the regulatory sandbox. The government also cooperates with academia and industry closely. Singapore University of Social Sciences and Global Fintech Institute, or GFI, provide appropriate fintech courses for the public and advise international and local organizations. Same with other universities and blockchain association in Singapore. Courses operated by GFI and supported by various central banks to empower small and medium enterprises have been launched in countries in Africa and Asia. These courses help those who need an upscale in digital literacy and sustainability. Singapore provides a safe and, steady and a stable environment for business development and idea sharing. Not all jurisdictions.
can discuss Web3 openly and candidly. What are the two most essential lessons Singapore has for policymakers and regulators on streamlining the adoption and safe integration of crypto assets while not stifling innovation? In my opinion, number one, paying equal attention to regulation and development. Singapore is friendly to innovation, but never condones bad behavior. Regulation is not the only purpose of policymakers, but a way to guide development. Different regulation actions at different development cycles. In the earlier stage of product development, MAS will not interfere much, but will give enterprises the space for innovation. When the product is ready for market mass adoption, the MES will focus on supervision to ensure customers' suitability with minimum systemic market risk. Singapore has, has achieved a good balance between regulation and development by adopting appropriate regulatory intensity for products in different development cycles corresponding to materiality and proportionality. Second, Government, academia, and enterprise can cooperate closely to provide good services for public. Monetary Authority of Singapore, MES, Singapore University of Social Sciences, SUSS, and Global Fintech Institute, GFI, signed an MOU in July to collaborate on education, research, and training that concerns the financial empowerment of micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. Roadmaps for AI, blockchain, and big data were developed as early as December 2020 by the Infocom Media Development Authority, drawing from the expertise in the academia as well as enterprises. By using verifiable credentials and starting with education, the education program are used to solve the problems of access to credit by MSMEs. This program is innovative and aims to educate micro, small, and medium enterprises in foundational digital financial literacy skills, enabling them to understand cross-border financial services better and helping them to thrive in the digital economy. The rollout of this program will become a live use case of how Web3 is used to solve real-world problems. We believe that helping enterprises survive and grow in the market can develop the potential of good services and products for the public. Academia can bridge uh, between government and enterprise to eliminate misunderstandings turn research into productivity and educate the public to enter the web tree in the correct way. Furthermore, many projects such as Ubin, Patio, Guardian, Danba, and others explore real world use cases for blockchain and crypto asset transactions by the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Project Ubin in phase two explored various privacy protection methods for applications. To me, this is one of the most important projects by MES. Finally, regulatory arbitrage and over-speculations are short-term phenomena, and the crypto winter is going to be short. In the longer term, governments that promote Web3 privacy protection using Web3 will gain the international community's trust and grow the virtual and metaverse economy securely and exponentially. I believe Singapore is moving in this direction, same with many other governments, with sovereign wealth fund investment and a pro-metaverse regulatory environment for Web3 asset ownership with consumer protection and sustainability. Those rare to do good projects will return in favor in no time 
and do well. Thank you. Have a good conference ahead. And once again, I thank British Blockchain Association for inviting me here today. So that was David Lee Kyo Chun from the Global FinTech Institute of Singapore. Uh, some very interesting points there about how Singapore is managing, uh, managing the, the digital assets in the current environment. Um, next up, we have Asi Kaneng Si of the Blockchain Association of Indonesia. Um, she is uh, particularly interested in, in how regulators are balancing legal frameworks um, and staying ahead of the, uh, the changes in the space. So Asi, over to you. Hi, hi, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Great, great, thank you, thank you, Brian. So I can just go straight, right? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank okay. you, Brian. Thank you, Professor Nassim. Um, um, I'd like to, you know, share my appreciation to the British Blockchain Association for the initiatives. So I think based on the topic of the panel is the crypto asset policy making and the future of global economy. What went well, what didn't go well, and what can we do better? So yeah, we'll try to cover the general picture of what is actually going on in Indonesia and what um, improvement we can uh, can be done. So yeah, um, the use of decentralized virtual assets is growing expeditiously in Indonesia and Southeast Asia's largest economy has the highest crypto adoption rate in the world along with Brazil. And unlike in many developed countries, the Indonesian government already sees crypto assets as a legitimate asset class with specific classification of futures commodity. The current data that we have shows that crypto assets transactions in Indonesia have reached the total value of 232 trillion rupees or nearly 15.6 billion US dollar with 15.6 million registered traders by the end of July 2022. And also not to mention Southeast Asia's digital economy is expected to expand to 363 billion US dollar by 2025, according to a recent Southeast Asia economy report from Google, Bain, and Temasek, surpassing the previous forecast of 300 billion US dollar. And nearly half of that growth is contributed by Indonesia. Um, so under the Ministry of Trade Regulation number 99 of 2018, that set out the legal basis of crypto assets as commodities, crypto assets regulation have been adopted in a massive percentage. Furthermore, the Indonesian Block uh, Commodity Futures Trading Regulatory Agency, or COFTRA, has issued several regulations in regards to accommodate the crypto asset transactions in Indonesia, one of many through Regulation Number 8 of 2021 that provide a thorough regulatory framework for the crypto asset trading in the futures exchange. The regulation set out specific market mechanism in accordance to the international standard with four major bodies that move the entire trading ecosystem to secure and fast state such as crypto asset futures exchange that will soon be approved the clearing house custodian and virtual assets service provider or VSP, all under coftra supervisions so we see that these regulations in indonesia have made significant progress um, toward building a comprehensive legal framework that will guarantee that the crypto sector thrives in the country even if it is not yet accepted for payment although in accordance with the financial action task force that have standards and guideline the coftra regulation has set much harder compliance requirements for visp such in the travel rule implementation and which crypto assets to trade in indonesia Secure, yes, but what extent that offshore regulation could or should accommodate? This is one of the unique states of crypto assets transactions in Indonesia, that to secure the local investor, every crypto asset that could be traded in registered VASP must be on the list that have been published by the regulator, aka Koftra. But considering the growing nature of crypto assets transactions, would this standard be relevant? So after the Ministry of Trade or Ministry of Trade officially classified the crypto asset as commodity in 2018, Kofstra published the first ever list for which crypto assets could be traded with only 229 of a thousand of crypto assets ever listed globally in 2020. And after years, they finally published the updated list that changed the 229 list into 383. With more or less two years of evaluation, the list has grown not even twice the previous which comes to small conclusions that with the growing nature of crypto asset transactions, these mechanisms couldn't be entirely effective, even with proper methods to evaluate the crypto assets. 
Not only that, the travel implementation, although worth complementing, will need more adjustment considering the cross-border nature of the transactions and risk in money laundering and terrorism funding. The current standards will require more data or information shared for VISB conducting the travel rule, but different travel implementation with higher requirements might not be possible for receiving fee SAP in this transaction. And once again, it is obvious that playing it securely might not be the best for the growing ecosystem. Not only under the recognition of our Minister of Trade, the government has officially designated crypto assets as objects of value added tax or VAT and begun the transaction of taxation on crypto assets purchases at 0.1%. The transactions, as mentioned earlier, earnings and capital gains will be subject to a 0.1% final income tax. Not to mention the different rates the government set to unregister VASP. But considering the cross-border side of the crypto asset transactions, nations should consider the idea of crypto asset harmonization to ensure a good playing level between VISP globally. So what should this mean? The lower crypto asset tax tariff would impact the whole ecosystem of trading, especially in regional scope, and create a market dominance in certain areas with lower tariff. So although there is room for more improvements, the government response um, towards the crypto assets regulatory development in Indonesia has shown great support towards the ecosystem. The government at this um, specific uh, discussion is COFTRA has opened up opportunities for the industry to contribute to policy making and market development through association, such in the recent plan in renewing the current the applicable regulation that monitor the whole crypto asset transactions and crypto asset exchange establishment. Although under extensive process, the crypto asset exchange is the pilot initiative that shows how massive the crypto asset transaction as a commodity is going to be. Not to mention the existence of OFTRA in the supervisory law role has created a secured stigma for the investors. Um, so yeah, innovation for a second economy is the motivation for the new growth of business. Moreover, the concept of ecosystems evidently places a strong emphasis on businesses' social responsibility. The inter-institutional interaction in the regulatory composing and collaboration in development process will push forward the industry to thrive. Such collaboration between business, government, public, and academics will create a good establishment for customer's expectation, product enhancement, collaborative innovation, and new organizational design. So the perfect examples will come into realization through the Indonesian government's plan to create a special committee for crypto asset under the COFTRA that consists of the quadruple helix innovation. The aim for this plan is to create good management in the new and future business models such as crypto secondary services, crypto innovations, metaverse, and so on that blur the boundaries between stakeholders. Considering the evolving business models in the future, the government will need to create a more collaborative approach towards policymaking and promote an open innovation system. And that is why the association API as the gateway between government, enterprises, public, and science is needed. And that's what we have been trying to do. So I think, yeah, that's a very short one. Uh, and I'd like to hear more from the other representative, of course, to learn um, from the other countries. Uh, Brian, uh, let you take over. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Um, fascinating insight. Um, I think that's the end of our session for the for the moment. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, we look forward to um, meeting everyone again. Eleven ten. In eleven ten, yes, eleven ten. So, so we have got about twenty minutes to take a break. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. So once thank again, thank you very much, Asi. Thank you, Asi. Take care.